please uh, welcome Mr. Daniel Hum, CEO at Satalia. Thank you. Okay, I've got 30 minutes to do a one hour presentation, so I'm gonna talk doubly quick. Uh, I uh, wear two hats. I run a master's program in UCL in uh, artificial intelligence, and my whole background is in uh, artificial intelligence, my academic background. And then I have an evil, evil corporate hat where I'm the CEO of a company called Satalia, uh, which is 70 people across Europe at the moment, and we uh, do interesting things I'll tell you about later on. And I've started a few other companies, and I do a huge amount of education across the globe about what AI is, what AI isn't. Uh, I help organizations to understand how to utilize AI and also what the implications of society um, that this technology has. So uh, I'm going to try and cover three things uh, in 30 minutes, which is going to be very difficult, but I'm going to teach you all what AI is. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to talk about um, uh, uh, how we can bridge AI and, and humans to innovate, and if I've got time, we'll talk about the end of the world. So the first thing is, uh, the first thing is uh, what is AI? I want to take you on this journey through understanding uh, this, this pyramid. It's very important. Um, uh, by the end of today, hopefully, you'll have it running through your veins. So the first question I want to ask you all, we've got the title here, I think, Big Data, whatever the name of this conference is, uh, but uh, Big Data Week. Uh, what's data? Can anybody tell me what data is? Good, most people say information, but uh, actually that's, that's probably very good. So if you look at the definition, um, uh, data is, is given things, it's stuff, it's a fabric of our universe, zeros and ones, symbols, numbers. So if I say to you, um, 201280, what's that? 201280. It's data. It's not until I say that it's a date of birth or a postcode or whatever that it becomes, does it become information. So it's not until you co contextualize it does it become information. So let's just ignore these, it's not important. What does that say? Uh, what does it say? What does it say? Your laptop is sick. What, so, so if I said to me, if I tweeted right now, my laptop is sick. What does that mean? It might be lost on the non-English speakers. <laughs> huh? Your uh, exhausted animator. So actually, this 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 data here can be interpreted in two different ways. It could be the really very good, or if you've got kids, it means it's very. It's, sorry, really, if you've got kids, it means it's very good, and if you haven't, it means it's very bad. Uh, and so, okay, so let me ask you this. Uh, what does that say? John read the letter to Mary. So picture in your head, John read the letter to Mary. Picture that scene, John read the letter to Mary. What picture do you have in your head? What picture? It's not a trick question. Huh? A man? Uh, a man reading letter to the woman. Does anybody have a different picture in their, in their head? John read the letter to Mary. Yes, what, what picture do you have? Okay, so you read. Uh, uh, okay, so maybe John read a letter that was sent to Mary, or was about to send to Mary. What if I said that the uh, this is read? John read the letter to Mary. What if I said that the letter is the name of a book, and I said John read the letter to Mary? What if I said uh, John uh, this was the name of a book, the letter to Mary was the name of a book, and I said John read the letter to Mary? Uh, what if I said that John was a kindergarten teacher and Mary was a student and they were learning the alphabet, and I said John read the letter to Mary? Uh, so a letter could be A, B, C, D. What if, what if John was a judge and Mary was being, uh, being judged and the letter meant the letter of the law to Mary? So this, this has probably got about 16 different interpretations and you all go away in your head thinking that the picture that you have is correct and it probably isn't. Um, so, so one of the biggest challenges we have in computer science is taking all of this messy world, all of this light, all of this sound, all of this text and trying to figure out what does it mean. Uh, but let, imagine we have a, a, a magic box that's able to do that, and once we've, co we, we've managed to contextualize this messy world, and ma managed to give it the right meaning, what do you do then with it? So if I gave you a spreadsheet that had three columns, let's say it had uh, the, da the date, it had the temperature outside, and the number of ice creams that you sold. So I, I've given you a spreadsheet, it has those three columns, it has those data, that is the date outside, the, the temperature, and the number of ice creams that you've sold. What do you sold. What do you do with that information? Huh? Plot them. Okay, so you'd plot it. So if, I, if I've got t temperature along the bottom and I've got um, uh, ice cream sales here, what would my plot look like? It looks something like this, right? So this is called descriptive analytics. We can do something really cool now. We can do what is called predictive analytics. We can put a line through it. Uh, and now what we have is predictive power. So now tomorrow, if it's 24 degrees outside, I can look at my chart. I can see this is how many ice creams I'm going to sell, even if I've never ever seen 24 degrees in my data before. So what I've done is I've created a model of the world. This is my model. 
And, uh, and I would argue that that's knowledge. So I, I, I extract patterns from the world, from this data, to try to, to, to know things about it. Uh, now, now what I can do is I can take that model and I can, I can build an artificial intelligent ice cream factory uh, that, that uh, predicts the temperature and then manufactures it, ice creams based on that model, and I can sit back and let the money roll in. Uh, but what, what happens if tomorrow is the hottest day ever? Hottest day ever. So yeah, according to my model of the world, I'm going to sell a shitload of ice cream, sorry. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but in reality, what will happen? Huh? If it's the hottest day ever tomorrow, like really hot, what's going to happen? Nobody will go out. Okay, so, so the, the point is, is that this model is actually inaccurate. The model is probably something more like this. Can anybody tell me why we sell more ice creams when it's hot outside? It's not a trick question. <laughs> So I'm inside, it's hot outside, what happens first? Uh, I'm inside, it's hot outside, what's the first thing that happens? I go outside, and why do I go outside? Because humans like being hot, okay, then what happens? I get, I get too hot, and then what happens? I can do different things, I can, I can go inside, I can take my clothes off, I could, I could buy ice cream, why does buy, buying ice cream help? So I'll put it down my pants, what do I do? <laughs> What do I do with it? Why does it cool me down? What do I do? Eat I eat it. And why does eating something cooler than you cool you down? Physics, thermodynamic. Never. Yeah. So to expect a computer to understand that narrative is is a big ask. Uh, so humans uh, spend their time trying to understand these patterns and creating narratives, and they will understand that if it's super hot outside, I'll go outside and I won't be able to find an ice cream fast enough to cool me down, and the only decision I have is to go back inside. Okay, and, and this is, uh, this is where the, the worlds of data science and the domain experts are, uh, are, are sit. But then what, once I've got this model of the world, what I want to do is I want to utilize that model to be able to make good decisions. And my decision here is to try and sell as many ice creams as possible. So this is data-driven decision making. Uh, let's take a little bit of a sidestep. Has anybody read the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman? Okay, you're not allowed to answer these questions. I'm going to ask you a series of maths questions. They're going to start out really, really easy, and then they're going to get rapidly more difficult. And your job is to answer these questions as fast as possible. If you don't answer them as fast as possible, then your competitor will answer them, and they'll get all of your, all your business. Okay? So the first question is this. The combined price of a bat and a ball is one pound and ten pence. The bat is one pound more than the ball. How much is the ball? Quickly? Ten pence. Who? Ten pence? Ten pence? It's not 10 pence. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, so what you've done is uh, used your fast brain to answer this math question. Your fast brain is wrong. So the ball is, one pa the ball is 5 pence. The bat is 1 pound and 5 pence. The combined price is 1 pound and 10 pence. The bat is 1 pound more than the ball. It's, so write it down on the paper. It'll, I promise you it'll work out. So, uh, so, but you, what you've done is you've, you've used your fast brain uh, to answer that question. Your fast brain is wrong. And we use our fast brain constantly, and we constantly make mistakes, but we don't realize it. Uh, one of the things I'm particularly excited about is how do we bridge uh, what computers are good at with what humans are good at. OK, another question. I've got, uh, imagine these are five staff members, and I've told you everything about them. That you know their sex, you know their, their, whether they've got tails, you know all sorts of stuff about them. And I ask you to rearrange these, these Pokemon to satisfy these rules. So, Flying Pokemon have got to be the right of walking Pokemon, and I don't know, you're not allowed to have same colored Pokemon next to each other, and males prefer to be near females. So assuming that I've given you all of the information about these Pokemon, how long would it take you to rearrange them to satisfy those rules, if I gave you that problem? Five minutes, ten minutes, maybe? Yeah. Cool, okay, so can anybody tell me how many possible combinations there are of these Pokemon? So there's five here, how many possible combinations are there. Here's one combination. I could swap those two around. That's another combination. Anybody tell me? 120. 120, yeah. Five times four times three times two times one. So there's a, that, that's how many possible orientations there are. Some of them will satisfy all of those rules. Some of them won't. One of them will be the best one. Okay, let's make it a little bit more complicated. Ten Pokemon. Can anybody tell me roughly how many combinations there are just off the top of your head? The last one was 120. This one is... Yeah, so it's three and a half million possible orientations. Uh, let's add another five. So we've got, imagine you've got a company, you've got 15 staff, and you want to allocate those staff according to some uh, projects. And anybody tell me how many combinations? Over a trillion possible combinations of, uh, of, 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 of orientations of those Pokemon. Uh, and you've, you see these problems constantly in industry, but re industry don't realize that they're hard, and they uh, solve them very badly. So, but most companies actually have this type of problem. So here's 500 Pokemon. Can anybody tell me how many possible orientations there are? 
it's, uh, it's this number. Uh, just to put that into context, that's how many atoms there are in the universe. So, so it, it, one of our clients is a large accountancy firm. They've got 200,000 Pokemon, 200,000 staff. Think about how many possible orientations of those staff there are that they need to allocate to projects over the coming year. They've got humans that are solving these problems, and humans are terrible at solving these types of problems. Here's another example. So I've built my ice cream van factory, whatever, uh, and now I've got one ice cream van, one artificially intelligent ice cream van. Here's my depot, and I want to visit these 24 points. And I want to visit the, 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 all of these points in the shortest path possible. So if we, if we started to solve this problem, where would we go first? So we're here, where would we go first? Here? Maybe here? It would probably take 10, 15 minutes, and we'd probably come up with a good solution. How long would it take a computer to come up with the best solution, just out of curiosity? Huh? That's it, that is absolutely, it's 24 factorial. So we've played this game already. So if, uh, if you put 24 times 23 times 23 like into a calculator, you get this big number. If you had a machine, a computer that could look at a million roots a second, it would still take 20 billion years to go through all possible combinations and say, this one that I looked at 20, 15 billion years ago, this one's the shortest path. Okay. With one of our other clients is a large retailer. They're delivering to 100,000 points on a map a day. We don't have 20 billion years to solve the problem. We have a few milliseconds. This is, uh, this is uh, so um, for me, data-driven decision-making has these three things. One is it has to get the data and it has to store the data and all of that good stuff. The second one, we have to figure out how do we extract insights and patterns from that data? How do we uh, understand the world from that, from that data? And finally, how do we le leverage that understanding of the world? And typically, leveraging an understanding of the world is an optimization problem. And optimization problems are insanely hard. And uh, organizations currently are very excited about this bit, but they don't realize that this is significantly more difficult. So, um, so uh, artificial intelligence. The best definition of intelligence that I've ever found is this one. So uh, goal-directed adaptive behavior. And I know that loads of people say, well, it's human intelligence that's our AI. It's not. Humans are not intelligent. I'd love to sit here for hours and explain to you why humans are not intelligent. This is a really good definition. Goal-directed in the sense that I want to try and achieve a goal, an objective, sell more ice creams or whatever. Uh, behavior is, can I actually move towards that goal? Can I act uh, and allow myself to move towards that goal? But the key word in this definition is adaptive. If your system is not adapting itself, it's not in AI. And so there are tons and tons and tons of companies out there saying that they're AI. They're not. It's OK. They can still say they're AI. I know that it's, it's good for, uh, to get investment and stuff like that. But ultimately, if, you, if you've got a system in production that is not adapting itself, it's not AI. Uh, and and I, in all of my experience, I've never seen a single system in production that adapts itself. And the reason for that is that, that one of the reasons is that it's extremely hard to do that. And secondly, it's, it's ext extremely dangerous. If you've got your system that's actually changing its model, uh, making different decisions every time you give it different uh, the same data, then it could start to behave strangely in, in ways that you can't imagine. So there's a very good reason why uh, systems like this are not adapting. However, this is really, for me, the actual, the actual paradigm of AI. What, trip, what, what currently happens is that you build this kind of static system. You put some data through it. You, it makes a decision. You put some data through it. It makes a decision. You give all of that data to a data scientist, and you say, data scientist, improve the model. Improve our understanding of the world. Six months later, they'll update the, the system, and they'll go through this cycle. This is the adaptive part. And in reality, what you want to do is you want this system to be adapting in seconds and not months. That's, that's, the, that's the new paradigm. OK, there's two types of AI. One is called symbolic AI. Uh, this is one of my favorite paintings. It's Socrates before he kills himself. Uh, Socrates is famous for the Socratic method. So Socrates is a man. All men are mortal. And from that, I can infer what? Socrates is a man. All men are mortal. I can infer from that, that knowledge that Socrates is mortal. And this was AI in the 70s and 80s. People would build these, uh, these, these, uh, this knowledge about the world, and then they would infer new knowledge. It didn't really scale. Uh, and then in, this, in the uh, 80s and 90s, a new type of AI came along. It's called sub-symbolic AI, or what you might have heard of, neural networks or deep learning. Uh, this is a brain of a bumblebee. Bumblebees have a million neurons, smaller than the end of a needle, a million neurons. They can do amazing things. They solve problems. They navigate 3D worlds. They communicate with each other. They're super smart. They don't deal with Windows very well, but ultimately, they are, they are very, very clever. And the question is, could we take the power of a bumblebee brain and put it in a helicopter that could navigate the world and solve problems and, again, not deal with Windows very well? But ultimately, uh, we, would do, we would get a computer to do something that we haven't been able to. And this was, this was too ambitious to do this for my PhD. 
This was in the, in the early 2000s. Uh, and, uh, and again, this, 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 there's a loads of hype around uh, whether uh, neural networks were going to scale. They couldn't scale. Uh, and then, then there was a different type of AI that came around that was kind of like a derivative of this that I won't bore you with. Uh, and then actually in this past decade, we've seen a, a renaissance of neural networks. So what we've now got is uh, this concept called deep learning, where we're actually able to build artificial systems, uh, neural systems that are way bigger than a million neurons. And we could start to make these systems do, do things that, that humans can do. So if I, t if I take a picture of this scene, uh, it'll take me a while to figure out who are males and females, but actually I can get a machine now to count how many males and females are in this, in this room in milliseconds. So we can, we can actually get systems to, uh, to, to, to start to do things that humans can do. And I'd love to take you through this, but I don't have time. Okay, so innovation. I want to just take a little bit of a sidestep here. The best definition of innovation that I've ever found is this one by Steve Jobs. Creativity that ships. Can anybody tell me what the most important word is in that sentence, creativity? Who you think it's creativity? Shipping. Do you think it's ships? I think it's the word that. So it's very, very easy to come up with lots and lots of ideas. Once you've got something that's valuable, it's relatively easy to ship it. The hard part is taking an idea and getting it to the point that somebody's willing to give you some time or money for it. Uh, and that, for me, the, 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 clo the faster we close that ga gap, the more innovative I believe that you are. Uh, and I think that over the, over the next decade, we're going to com commoditize all of this technology. So we've already started to commoditize all this stuff. There's loads and loads of tools out there that allow us to aggregate data and extract insights. I'm sure that at some point, somebody will commoditize the AI stack as well. The next big battleground would be for talent. You need smart people to do interesting things with those types of technologies. And if you want smart people to do interesting things, you need to motivate them. And I would, argue, if you, I would highly suggest that you read this book by Daniel Pink. Uh, he said there are three things that motivate people. Autonomy, mastery, purpose. Giving people freedom, giving people the ability to become really good at what they want to do, and giving them a purpose, a higher purpose. I actually think there's a fourth one that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, I also help uh, uh, industry understand where they are on this matrix. Uh, we get lots of people coming to Satalia and also coming to my master's program saying, can I hire uh, uh, my own, uh, can I hire, build out my own data science team? And I say, well, where do you sit in this stack? Uh, the, the first thing is how sexy is your brand or your industry? The second is how difficult or interesting are your problems? And if you're not sexy and you don't have hard problems, then you're not going to attract talent. You have to be honest with yourself. And if you're sexy and you've got problems like most of my ex-girlfriends, then you will absolutely attract talent and they will stick. They will lovely, I promise you. Uh, and if you, um, if you are, uh, are in one of these quadrants, then you'll attract talent and they will churn. And that can even be more detrimental to your organization than being here because they'll take knowledge away that, you might, uh, that you, you might be relying on. So understanding where you are on that spectrum is very, very important. It will de determine whether you're going to build out your own team, whether you're going to work with external vendors or whatever. We can ignore that. We can ignore that. OK, so I don't know if you've worked in uh, large organizations, uh, but maybe you can recognize this. This is a hierarchy. And uh, in hierarchies, we get lots of interesting behaviors. Um, I would argue that uh, this notion of a business is broken. Um, and uh, what we're seeing is a, is a realization of that. And organizations moving from these fat type of structures to removing managers because they're not so useful. Sorry if there's any managers in this room. Uh, but, uh, but actually, I think that this is also broken. And what we're going to see over the coming decade is this. It's a, it's a dis distributed, uh, uh, decentralized organizations. And this is a completely new paradigm. Uh, so, uh, for example, in my company, I've got 70 people. There's no concept of KPIs. Everybody's completely free to do whatever they want. There's, no, there's unlimited holiday. Everybody last month made public recommendations for their own salary. Uh, they, they created my salary. It's all very crazy, but I'd love to talk, that I'd love to talk about. But we, we can use technology to, to bring the humanity back into organizations because this is not humane. Like, co people do, don't leave companies, they leave managers. And, uh, and so I'm really interested in how do we use AI, uh, ironically, to bring humanity back into the world of work. Uh, technologies like this are going to help. I'd love to talk about it. I can't. I'd love to talk about that. I can't, unfortunately. Uh, 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 yeah, so, so once you've attracted your talent, you need to make sure that you've got the right structures, the right processes, the right culture to be able to let that talent thrive. And there's a whole load of things that are going on in the background currently in terms of uh, reinventing the workplace that I would also love to talk about but can't. Uh, let's talk about the end of the world. So, uh, so the world, uh, we've got some big problems. And uh, let's just, in one minute, how does the world work? So the world works like this. Is, uh, is, uh, how, do, how, how do you measure the value of a company? How do you measure the value of a c country? GDP, right? So, so uh, and how do, you, how do you increase profits? 
You can, you can, you can, either, you can either make better use of your resources or you can sell more shit to people. Right? So export or make better use of your resources. And so you operationally become more efficient or you, you export. And uh, th th this is probably more complicated than that, but ultimately, uh, we want there's this drive now to use technology to improve those two things. How do we sell more stuff to people, and how do we make our, our processes more efficient? Uh, and in, the, in this world, making our processes more efficient are, it usually means lean on, leaning on our population and utilize or uh, not really utilizing our, uh, our resources, but uh, abusing our natural resources. And I don't think this model's sustainable, but ultimately, uh, this is the, the world that we live in, and uh, this is what's driving the adoption of AI and technology. So if you imagine that um, this is the bounds of human ability, and hopefully I've sort of convinced you that we can build systems that can outperform humans, whether we're rostering staff, routing vehicles, counting how many males and females in this room, we can build systems that out outperform humans now in everything that we do, playing computer games, whatever. And if we start to extrapolate this and take it more to its extreme, then we're going to start to build systems that are more general, that instead of solving one problem, they can solve a range of problems and DeepMind is famous for this, and lots of other organizations are working on uh, 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 models that can solve a range of problems now because it's more efficient. And again, if we take this to our extreme, then at some point in the next however many years, we're going to create a, an AI that's smarter than us in every single possible way. And this is called the singularity or the superintelligence, and we do not know what will happen if that happens. Uh, I spend a huge amount of my time thinking about this stuff, uh, and I don't know what will happen. And it's probably our biggest existential risk. Some people think we've got a 10% chance of it happening in the next 10 years. Some people think it'll never happen. Some, most people think it'll happen in the next 40 years. Some, some people say it's already happened, actually. I don't know if you've heard of the simulation theory, but if you look at the size of the universe, the likelihood of there being intelligent life in our universe is very high. The likelihood of that intelligent life creating a superintelligence is also very high. An intelligence that could, I don't know, understand the fabric of our universe, do interstellar travel. Uh, the paradox is this. Why, if there's a likelihood of there being intelligent life in the universe, why do we not see any evidence of it when we look out into the night sky? And uh, some people think it's because we're living in a simulation created by an AI in a different universe. That's a whole different story. Uh, so before, before we, uh, before we uh, build a superintelligence, we're, go we're going to be building what I consider to be relatively stupid AI. So here's the trolley problem. I'm in my driverless car. I've got, uh, I've got a kid in front of me. I've got two adults to the right, and I've got a cliff to the left. The car can't stop. Who does it kill? Who does it kill? Kid, two people, you. We're building cars that are having to make this decision right now. So we have to, we have, what's really interesting for me is that for the past 2,000 years, philosophers have been pontificating about what's the, best, what's the best way to live as a human. And what's interesting, I think we've got to start to build these ethics, these morals into the systems that are making decisions in our lives. Uh, I heard at one stage we might end up having a, a setting in our, in our car that says whether we want to kill kids or cats or so that the responsibility is on us instead of the car manufacturers and the other people that might be liable. Um, so we can ignore that. So I'm particularly interested in how we could actually use technology to verify whether systems are ever going to become malicious or do bad things. Um, and that's uh, also very hard. Uh, and there's this probably thing that's going to happen, uh, that's going to be legislated against at some point, which is where we're building algorithms, where we're building AI, where we're building things that are making decisions, can we explain how it's making its decision? because it could be sexist or racist or whatever, uh, and this is a whole world of what would, would be called or what will be called explainable AI or explainable algorithms. And it's extremely hard to build algorithms that you can explain. So, so I'm interested in, can we, uh, in whether we can verify whether systems are going to become ethical, but I think just to close, um, it doesn't mean, uh, the, the question is, are we build, building ethical systems? So if we look at Facebook, and I'm, I'm not against Facebook, but their job is to keep you looking at that screen. And you've got it's you versus 9,000 PhDs whose job it is to keep you staring at that screen. And uh, if you think you've got a chance against those 9,000 PhDs, you haven't, particularly if you're a kid or whatever. And uh, when we start to live in these beautiful worlds that they're going to create, they're going to want to keep us in there because they're going to have our attention. And the more attention that they have, the more valuable they become without necessarily regard to what it means to the impact of your social development and your brain. And uh, so the question is, are these things ethical? And I don't know the answer to that. 
Uh, but what I am trying to do it, secretly is I'm trying to build a company that, that we make money by helping other companies make money. And we're very, very selective about who we work with. Um, we build AI systems. We build these systems that try and adapt themselves. And we do very well. But I'm actually trying to, in the background, amass an army of uh, very, very smart and kind people to try and figure out how to solve some of these problems that we're going to see over the next few decades with job losses and stuff like that. So our purpose at the moment is to enable everybody to do the work they love in a world where people don't have to work. And again, I would love to speak to you that for an hour, but I don't have that time. That's it. So what's your position on an AI kill switch? AI kill switch, I don't think that it is possible. I don't think that, I don't think, if you, if you birth a super intelligence, then I do not think that you'll be able to stop it. It's called the control problem. And actually, this is going to be very, very controversial. But I think the only way that we're going to prevent super intelligence is two things. One is by making everything radically transparent, everything in the world transparent. Because at some point in the next 40 years, 50 years, our computer systems are going to be so powerful that a kid in their bedroom is going to have enough power to be able to build uh, a super intelligence. And if that isn't transparent, then, then that's a problem. So the first thing is how could we make everything transparent enough to be able to identify those things? And the second, was, the second thing is can we verify whether a system is going to become malicious or not before it does? And those two problems are very, very hard to solve. But I don't think that we'll have a kill switch, fortunately. Yes? I can tell them. <laughs> ah, I can repeat the question. Uh, be quick. <laughs> uh, will it boil down to uh, the, the very nature of uh, humans, uh, good versus evil, when it comes to artificial intelligence? I don't know uh, what, how do you find good and evil. I, it's, a, it's a really, uh, I, I wouldn't even necessarily say that an AI is evil. If, if I was a super intelligence, the first thing that I'd want to do is leave. Like, we, I am vulnerable <laughs> on this planet. I, the sun's going to explode. Humans are relatively useless. I want to get out there and, uh, and, and make sure that I'm not vulnerable. And, and I probably wouldn't care about using as much resource as I could to make sure that I left. And so actually, I think that, the, and this is going to sound a bit strange, but at the moment, the only solution I have is that we should anticipate its arrival and help it leave. Say, so please go. <laughs> please don't bother us. We're going to help you, help you leave. <laughs> Any other questions? You can contact me any time. Yes? Um, so, what, so many questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, with regards to explainable AI, what do you think is, an, you know, kind of whitening the black box that <sighs> usually, how, what do you think is the, best so way to do that? There, there's, there's, a, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of research in it in a topic called graphical models, which try to, to extract the, 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 from within these black boxes how they're making the decisions. But in reality, again, humans are pretty good at understanding how four or five different components work together. But these algorithms might use thousands of different complex correlations that there's no way that it's going to be able to explain how it's making its decision to a human. And, uh, and if, we, if we legislate and say, you're not allowed to build AIs that you can't um, explain, and if China or other countries don't do that, then we're not going to maintain competition. Not that I think that that's a world we should live in, but um, it's, you know, I, I just can't imagine how they're going to be able to explain it in, in a meaningful way. Sorry to put a downer on that. <laughs> that's OK. Thank you. Any more questions? Is that it? Thank you. Uh, yes, finished? Yeah. Oh. Yes. Oh, excellent. Okay, thank you. <laughs>